welcome to lecture 2 and so in the last lecture remember what we were doing was we were looking at different approaches for control right so we started all the way on the right with a technique which was memorizing and repeating and then we walked our way through through behavior cloning through some physics models to do trajectory optimization and then end to end learning of some models right uh what to do okay then you know so where we ended our last lecture was we can do behavior cloning to achieve good performance where it is hard to achieve superhuman performance with behavior cloning and what we wanted to do was to make machines have algorithms which automatically figure out how they make decisions for this lecture we'll be focusing on this part and see what are some of the challenges uh, in doing this and what are some concrete algorithms for decision making so let's first consider a setup i have a robotic system and it has this current observation which is an image i have these objects on the table you want to rearrange objects in a different configuration shown by a goal image on the right similarly i might have a different task where i start off with rope in a particular configuration and i want to tie a knot for instance so in brief you know what we are trying to do is to learn a policy which takes in state x as input and it produces an action a and when i execute this action in the environment i get to my new state x c plus 1 if this new state ends up being close to the goal state we get a high reward and the whole game is how do we maximize the sum of rewards that the agent ends up getting and and the hope is that by doing this maximization we will or the machine will learn a strategy to perform the task and in some cases you know it might go beyond human intuition and how well it performs the task now the one question which comes up is what are these parameters theta i i need to initialize them to some particular value so initially these values are random because i don't have any information about the system and then i would want to learn the values theta which maximize the reward the question is how to learn this if you can learn them well there are many different applications which have come out in the recent years like for example playing the game of go or playing this multiplayer game or you know, even performing this you know hand object manipulation task right where this is a hand which has 24 degrees of freedom that is trying to manipulate this cube to the goal position shown on the right or we can use the same set of techniques to perform you know locomotion so over here you see a quadruped robot which is walking in terrains that has never seen before and this system is really robust you can put it anywhere you want and it's going to work you know it's probably never going to fall or it, you know the yeah so you you know might have seen some videos from boston dynamics before a lot of those videos were based on model based techniques this is a purely reinforcement learning system deployed in the real world so similarly you know there have been other applications for example learning how to grasp objects over here you are seeing a setup where there are multiple robots what they are doing is initially they start off with a policy which is random that means that they don't know where to put the gripper to grasp the object and they might end up failing right for and over time they will learn how to adjust the gripper so that the these systems or these agents can successfully pick up objects so we'll be you know looking at some of these things in the course you know how what kind of algorithms go behind building these systems there are other topics of interest also for example i might have two agents competing 
with each other. Right? So you can think of you know, competition in two ways. You can say, well, you know, one way to think about this is I want to learn skills. I want to learn useful things about the world. And the way to do this is to make agents compete with each other, right? Kind of what evolution did, right? There were resource constraints, there was competition and humans evolved at some point. So depending on, you know, if you want competition as a source of developing intelligence, or you're just interested in two agents interacting with each other. And so what algorithms go in to having these two agent systems or competitive systems to learn something useful about our environment or to learn a useful skill to be in the environment. So over here, you know, if you were watching this video, you would see, you know, these ants learn some kind of strategies to walk around and to push each other, you know, out of the arena. Right? So it's, and the interesting question is what algorithms will lead to more and more interesting strategies. And you, can, you could have learned a very dumb strategy, which is not to move anywhere, but that would not have been so much fun, right? It's more fun if you kick the other agent out of the arena. So one more demonstration of the skill learning is, was the following paper, which is from two years ago. So there are two teams and they're playing the game of tag. There's a red team and the blue team. And what the red team wants to do is it wants to go and kill the blue guys. So initially everything is random. So everything is just moving randomly. And you know, blue guys sometimes get killed. Now with time they realize that, oh, actually I can put these yellow blocks and prevent the red guys from killing. Right? So they learn the strategy of putting these yellow blocks so red guys you know, cannot die. Now what would happen, right? You see this ramp lying over there, right? So maybe the red guys will learn to use you know, the ramp. You know, this is what they end up doing. And they end up using that amp, they come in and blue guy, the blue team is like, oh no, what's happening? You know, so now the blue team needs to change its strategy, right? So now they might learn something different. You know, they come and they steal that amp in and then they block, right? So now the red team cannot, you know, come and kill them, right? So what you see is maybe the objective function is very simple. It is uh, killing the other team or it's just competition. So killing is the wrong word to be using. You know, it's, it's competition between two sets of agents. And it leads to a sequence of complex behaviors, which I did not have to specify, but they emerge by optimizing the, the reward function. A most recent example is this balloon stabilization. So what you see is a balloon which is supposed to provide with Wi-Fi connection. And this was a nature paper a uh, couple of months or a couple of weeks back coming out of Google again. And the problem is that if you have balloon in the air, wind is blowing and you really don't know or have a good model of how the wind blows. So to have the balloon be stable is non-trivial. So they leverage reinforcement learning to stabilize the balloon. And then there are you know, many applications. You know, for example, you might want to predict what is the value of the stock and also whether you should sell a stock or not to sell a stock. Or if you have a data center and you want to figure out how much to cool and how much not to cool. Or you have some other scenarios of human robot interaction. Right? So reinforcement learning on one hand is, uh, is a research topic. On the other hand, as you have seen in some videos that I just presented, that it is starting to come up in the real world, right? For example, with the quadruped in motion, the balloon which was deployed and even the grass to the works. So before I jump into more details, so Ayush has a question. Can you please give some intuition? Well, the reward function was very simple over here. It was whether you survive or you don't survive. And that's it. You know, there is no other reward. It's survival reward. 
Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Any any other you know comments questions you know before we jump jump in. Um, what's the reward? Sparse or dense? It's sparse reward. Okay, so it it means that it kind of learned to do that task with a sparse reward, which which seems kind of pretty hard to do. I guess it's it's they had a lot of compute to do that. I guess. Yes, yes, they had a lot of compute, and that is why they could optimize the sparse reward. So that is something you know we will want to look at in the course, right? I mean, if you have sparse reward, then what kind of methods could you build? And sometimes you just have to rely on compute. But in some scenarios, you could, you can be more clever. So in in the previous work, is there like a single policy learned independently for each agent, or is it like shared policies for? the agents on two sides of the wall i think the policies are different for these agents it's not the same policy okay but if we are on different sides of the wall it's like if we are on the same side of the wall we share a policy like the two agents on one side i i believe so but i will you know recheck the paper i am not 100% confident on that i believe the policy if you are on the same side it is the same and if you're on a different side, it is different. But I, I think this is something we'll discuss in more detail later on. I don't remember precisely on top of my head. Yeah. Is the case. But but we'll come to it. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I had another question, probably not as pertinent, but mm -hmm. like, do you think like changing the number of agents can have a significant effect on the kind of emergent behavior that arises out of a system? It's like in multi-agent systems, like when outside the RL community, people generally take, think of 100,000 agents, 50,000 agents. Mm -hmm. But then when RL tasks, we see five, eight, 10 agents. So do you think like the emergent behaviors are really transferable if we increase the number of agents? So I think it, it depends on two things, the complexity of the environment and the number of agents, right? So if, for example, you only have a single RAM, even if you put more agents, it isn't really going to help that much, right? But if you were to, you know, if you require to lift something which two agents cannot lift, then having more agents are going to be useful. So it's also worth emphasizing that the perspective from which these works were done is typically very different from the perspective in which people use multi-agent systems. It, for example, you might say, I have a network of small robots which are exploring an environment. So over there, the task for the robots is well-defined. You could also have a centralized controller and say, just explore the environment or find a particular target, right? Over here, the point was not to make the agents coordinate towards an end goal, but to say, can we learn interesting, intelligent behavior from a very simple reward function? So it's almost trying to mimic evolution in some ways, right? So, I mean, the, the question comes from, if we want to build artificial intelligence, you know, what should we do, right? So this one approach is that is built in everything, you know, which was a steps planning kind of approach. The agent should do this when you get this situation, right? The other is, you know, maybe I'll give it some supervision, but it's not going to be as extreme, but it is going, it's going to be of the form. Maybe I'm going to demonstrate the task to the agent, or I'm going to give you a label, is it a cat or is it a dog? Right. And you can go on the other extreme and say, given that is too much, what about I just get an interesting environment, give it a very simple reward function, can intelligence still emerge? Right. So I think because of the difference in how the multi-agent community perceives multi-agent problems, they perceive it in the sense of how do I make agents collaborate to achieve an end task? versus a lot of the work in reinforcement learning has touched upon, can we use multi-agents as a way to evolve intelligence? Right. Does not mean that I cannot use it for collaboration of multiple agents, it's also done. But we specifically the works I was presenting and works which have become more popular have had the theme of emergence. Thanks, yeah, this is very helpful, thank you.
Cool. So there is some question about sparse rewards and dense rewards. So I think that is the term we're going to discuss in the future. In short, I think the answers on the chat window are precise. Sparse reward is something which you only get when you reach the goal. For example, if I'm going to the airport, I only get a goal reward if I'm at the airport versus you know, the reward being distance, which will be a dense reward because at every step, I will end up getting a reward. So that's the difference between sparse versus dense reward. And you know, the question we are going to be asking in this course is how does all of this work? You know, reinforcement learning and some special cases of reinforcement learning, you know, bandits, contextual bandits, but also, you know, everything else that we discuss, right? And how do these things, you know, connect together? And when I am faced with a problem, which one of these methods should I be choosing? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the most general way of doing it, which is reinforcement learning. And we will try to see what do we know now, what the problems are, and how do we overcome it. So you know, let's start with an example where I want this quadruped, which is not a quadruped in this you know, image. It's a two-legged animal, typically called as the cheetah in the reinforcement learning literature, to run. So the first thing I'm going to define is the state space. And the state pretty much means what is, you know, how do I represent the current system? So over here, I could represent the system by specifying the location of each joint and the rotation of each joint or I could specify the system by just saying the image is what the system is, or I could have a combination of both the location or and the image. Okay. So it's a choice that we make as modelers. How do we define the state? And this is something we touched upon in the previous lecture where we were looking at you know, pushing objects or manipulating ropes. You know, we needed to define things like mass, friction and so on, which constituted the state of the system. The next thing we need to define is how is this system affecting its environment? So what is the action space? So the action space, for example, could be the torque I'm applying on the motors on each joint. And when I take an action, we end up coming to the next state. If I take one more action, I come to the other state. And then we are defining a reward. The reward, for example, could be the speed at which this theta is moving. Then my problem will become, can I come up with torques I need to apply, which is going to maximize the velocity of the motion. So let's try to formalize some of these. So I have this loop where I have the agent. It acts in the environment. I come to the next state. I get the reward and I again act. So I'm doing my actions A1 to AT. I get my rewards R1 to RT, and I'm trying to maximize the sum of rewards. Now, the way I'm maximizing the sum of rewards is through this policy pi. But when I take the action, I end up going to the next state. So now this function, which takes me from my current state and my action to the next state is called as the environment model. And the mapping from state to action is called as the policy. Now, in some cases, the environment model is given. Right? So what are these examples? For example, consider the game of tic-tac-toe. You exactly know what is going to happen next. Right? Or if you are willing to assume physics, physics is telling you exactly what is going to happen next. So if I assume a model, these methods are called model-based methods, but sometimes we don't have access to a model or it's very hard to even estimate the model. If, for example, if I want to forecast the stock market, it's a hard problem, right? So maybe instead of first trying to learn a model and then use that to optimize a policy, 
I can directly optimize a policy. Right? It's like a famous saying, you know, if you have a hard problem to solve, don't try to solve a harder problem first. Right? Anyways, investing in stock market is not straightforward. You know, don't try to predict everything first and then come with a strategy. Right. Now, you know, let's look at what happens in implementing these model free methods. So I'm going to illustrate this through a simple example. I have an agent, right? And this agent can take some actions, say A1, A2, and if it hits the boundary of this arena, it gets a negative reward. Versus if it reaches the, uh, the yellow thing over here, it gets a reward of plus one. I see the heading is saying solving the MDP, but if that term doesn't make sense, I think it's fine. Just don't, don't pay attention to the headings of this one slide. Right? Now, what versus if I go on this other yellow thing, it's a reward of plus five. Right? So this is what my problem setup is. So what does the agent do? It had it took these two actions with a reward of minus one. So this is the experience which the agent has collected. Then I might, you know, try another sequence of actions. Now, where are these sequence of actions coming from? Remember when we were trying to write down reinforcement learning, we said the parameters theta are random, right? For these actions are being generated by those initial set of parameters. So again, I might do a random sequence of action or sequence of action to get a reward of minus one. Again, I document it. Right? But this is my agent acting in the world and collecting data. And you know, once in a while, the agent might also take an action which actually go to my goal. And I get a reward of plus one. So now I have this data set in which I have trajectories and I have the corresponding reward for each of these trajectories. Now, in some ways, this looks pretty much like supervised learning, right? Versus in, in the sense that I have the image of a cat and I have the label cat. So one thing that we discussed last time is that in supervised learning, the label, for example, the label cat is known versus in the left-hand side, the, the label of the reward is not given to me. I need to search for it on my own, right? Because the human is not telling me what actions lead to high reward or low reward. The other thing is typically in supervised learning, the data set is also assumed to be given. Right? And in reinforcement learning, the agent is collecting its own data. That is, it needs to explore. And it turns out that this exploration actually is what critically distinguishes a supervised learning from reinforcement learning. Now, how is that? You know, let's let's look at this. Right? What what does exploration create? So, you know, my goal is to find the sequence of actions. You know, I could take this data set and just try to learn from this data set to find a sequence of actions. Now, what might happen? You know, I have this one trajectory which has a higher reward. I have these other trajectories which have, you know, lower reward. So maybe if I do this optimization, I will end up getting this particular strategy, right? So this looks good, right? Anyone, you know, wants to disagree and say, well, this is not good? Or, you know, does everyone feel that, you know, this is perfect. Is there can't enumerate, you can't enumerate all possible state spaces? I cannot enumerate all possible state spaces. Or you can't you can't possibly know that you're at a global maximum. Yes. Yeah, so you cannot possibly know that you are at a global maximum. For example, in this particular setup, I might have missed 
the other yellow block which has a reward of plus five. Right? Because I am generating my own data, I never know how much of the state space I've actually explored. Right? And that is you know, one real problem which exploration introduces. So I can learn suboptimal behavior. And what that does lead, what that does is it leads you to this dilemma, which is exploration and exploitation dilemma. If I have this reward, is this the best thing? Should I be trying out more things? Because you know, if I go, you know, in a different direction, I'm not going to get a reward for quite some time. Right? So I'm going to have regret that I'm not getting reward. So what, what should I do? Right. So this is this is the exploration, exploitation dilemma. Because sometimes if you said, you know, maybe this reward is, you know, I'm getting a reward of plus one. I, I believe I should get a higher reward, you know, and then you end up exploring and, but the environment had, you know, some other reward of minus five over here, you know, before. So you might just go and hit this reward, right? So, you know, so, so, so because you don't really know this information, about what is the maximum achievable reward. Maybe in some situations we do, and then you can say, well, yes, I am at the office. But in many cases, like in real life, you really don't know. Is this the best you can be doing or can you do even better? And which leads to this exploration exploitation dilemma. And this is going to be the most central theme of all methods, which are not supervised learning, which involve an agent collecting its own data. It fundamentally needs to solve this problem. So before you know, we delve into it, I'll take a few minutes to see if there are questions. So William, you have a question. Can you add some stochasticity to prevent the local minima? So you, you can. What you can do is you can do you know random restarts, for example. But that still is not going to guarantee you. You are going to you're going to increase the diversity of your data set, but you're not going to guarantee that you achieved the global optima. Another question which comes up is what is exploitation in this context? So exploitation, what I meant was. You know, suppose after some time, I have some data set and I optimize using this data set and I find this policy, right? I can say, I can just use this policy and not try out any other thing and just keep doing this because I'm going to get a reward of plus one. So I'm going to exploit what I already know is the best thing to be doing. So that is why it, it is exploitation, right? Exploration would be to say, well, I'm getting a good reward, but you know, I think I can do better. You know, so let me go and try something else. It's like you have a restaurant that you like to go and eat food. And the question is, you are hungry. Should you go to a pizza place which you know gives you good pizza? Or there's this new pizza place which opened up. You know, should you go and try over there, right? So that is the exploration versus exploitation problem. Okay, let me see if there are more things. So Donchi, you had a question about model-based RL. Uh, I would, let, let's hold that question. We can take it up later. Thank you. But once we come to that part. Mm -hmm. So Dhruv says you could always remember the local maxima before exploring more right. Yes, you can remember the local maxima. And there are, you know, strategies of, uh, of doing it. Yes, you can remember it, but that doesn't help you in solving the exploration exploitation dilemma. Right? Because typically if you are not getting a reward, you are losing something, right? I mean, how that happens, it will become clear in a few examples. And if it does not, then Zrov come back with that question. That why remembering the local maxima might not be the best solution. We'll, we'll see that. But let's look at, you know, what are some other scenarios in where exploration can be quite hard. Right? So imagine you're on Spotify 
And what does Spotify want? Spotify wants that you are hooked to Spotify. And then suppose you love classical music, you know, you love Beethoven and you're like, okay, I'm going to listen to symphonies, right? And then what Spotify is trying to do is to figure out do you like other kinds of music genres also. It is going to explore by suggesting other music. You know, it could suggest you, for example, Lady Gaga. So maybe you are the kind of person who really loves classical music and Lady Gaga is not your thing. Right? You look like this, you know, you'll, you'll not be happy if Spotify did that. Right? So sometimes, you know, there are reasons why exploration is not a good idea, right? Or, or you want to explore in the sense that you want to give recommendation to the user that he or she might like, but they have not encountered before, but there's also a high penalty of giving those suggestions, which is the user might get disengaged if the suggestions are bad. And sometimes exploration can be very costly. Right, because if your system fails, you fail. You know, as someone said on the chat, you know, you will only know the reward when you die. It's like you will only know the reward, you know, once you are in the state of lying in the ground. Right, so exploration can be costly. You wouldn't be able to tell if I'm going to get a negative reward unless you end up actually getting it. So the first question of interest comes up is, you know, is there a method that will achieve the highest reward? You know, are there setups in which we can have an algorithm which can overcome the exploration exploitation dilemma? And how fast can I come to the right solution? Which means what is my overall regret? Now we are going to define these terms, but you know, so let's study this with help of an example. So suppose, I have three versions of my website. And there's a user who is coming to my website. Now I can show him or her any version of my website, which corresponds to three possible actions over here, A1, A2, and A3. Right. So what these three versions could be, they could just be versions which look different. If I am selling some products on, on the internet, there could be different arrangements of the product. So a user one comes in, you know, I show him this particular website, I'm going to get some money, right? If he buys a product. Similarly, a second user comes in, you know, I show a different website to her, I might get some money. So what I'm now doing is I am getting this sequence of actions and I'm getting a reward for each of these actions. And now these rewards are stochastic. You know, why are they stochastic? Because if I just take an action, the reward can really depend on the person who is coming, right? Some people might buy, some people may not buy. So I really don't know if they're going to buy or not, right? So now I have time which is going on and I want to maximize my sum of rewards, right? So this is where you know, just remembering my local maxima is not going to help me. Because if I just remember the local maxima, keep on doing this, then I might miss out on a product that I should have shown, which would have increased my profit a lot. But, but if I don't do my local maxima, I might end up showing some products which are really bad and no one is going to buy. But the local maxima doesn't really solve the problem of finding the best possible or the best possible rewards or maximizing the amount of money I want to make. So this is exactly what is, uh, I mean, it happens if you go to a casino, right? you're pulling arms and you know, arms might have like the probability of pulling each of them. So a, a different arms might have a reward associated with them. And I'm trying to figure out what is the best arm I need to put. And this is known as the multi-arm bandit problem. So suppose I pull the ith arm for ki number of times, I can estimate how good the arm is, which I'm going to call as mu i. So the ith arm is pulled ki times. 
Yes. So to clarify, yes, the page is the action and reward is the money paid by the shopper. That is correct, Ayush. So Simon, you have a question about strategies to find the higher reward while mitigating risk of finding the really bad ones. Yeah, so that alludes to some topics in offline reinforcement learning that we'll end up covering later in, in the course, which it's an excellent question. Okay, so, okay, so I have the return of my ayat arm as mu i, and you know, as we have said, the goal is to maximize the reward over time. So now for a second, you know, let's assume the problem was simple. You know, the rewards are deterministic. Can we find the best solution? To this problem. So suppose if I showed one website, you always knew what, you know, it always made the same profit. What, what is the strategy you would use to find, I mean, to maximize your reward? Right, so, okay, so there are suggestions coming up in the chat that, you know, so it depends on how many tries I've had, but okay, let's squint over some of those details. And I think the answers which are coming is maybe I can just take, I can try every arm and then choose the best one, right? So I can just try everything one by one. If I have enough number of trials available to me, and then I can choose the best one. And then I can just keep on using that. But because the rewards are stochastic, I don't know which is the best one because I don't have access to the exact reward or the ground truth reward. But what I have access is, an, is to an estimate of the reward. Right. So this is you know, what leads to the strategy called explore first. Right. What I'm doing is there's some time, say time k, until which I'm just exploring. In the deterministic case, you could just try out all the K or all the N arms, right? And find the best one and use it. But because the rewards are stochastic, I cannot just try out each arm once and choose the best one because that, that might be erroneous. So instead, what I'm going to say, I'm going to just keep on randomly choosing each arm until time k. At time k, I'm going to choose the best one and then continue. Right? So at time k, each arm has been sampled equally, so it's about k by n. Right? After these k rounds, I can choose the arm with the highest reward and just keep taking this later on. Right? So I have the explore phase and then we have the exploit phase. So this is the mapping of the strategy we come, came up with in the deterministic case to what we might end up doing in the stochastic case. So the question is, is this the best that we can do? Right. So this is what I think Curtis, you also asked the same question, right? I mean, is what, what is the best we can do? Is this the best or not? Let me see, there's one more question. I used to, you had, is the goal to make it continuous? Use cunning judgment. Yes, so the goal is not to make, no, the goal is not continual, but it is a continual process, right? For new shoppers who are coming in, you want to optimize for your reward. So you want to use the previous knowledge to change what you might suggest to new users. And you know, if you don't make money today, I, I do not have a time machine, right? So I cannot come back and change my action. I can't do it. So it, it and because of that practicality, it becomes a continuous process. Right. So let's try to answer this question. But in the first question, which comes is, how do what do we even mean by best? You know, what do I mean by best? So typically, to measure best, 
we define something called as an oracle. Right? An oracle says, what is the sum of rewards if magically I knew what was the best action to take? Right? Or think of it other way, suppose you're playing God and you know the best arm, right? And you just use the best arm at every time. Right? And that is what the reward is, R star. And this is why this is called an oracle, right? Because this is some information that I don't have a prime, right? But just to but just, but just to know how good I am to the best possible scenario, I can invoke the oracle and compute the difference from it. And this is what is called regret. Right? And the goal is to minimize regret. And there's a certain detail to it also, right? We just don't care about minimizing the regret eventually. We also care about how fast, you know, we minimize the regret. Okay. So let's assume that the reward is between zero and one. And if I have gone to T time steps, what is the worst regret that I can have? So Jules, you have a question, how can we access R star? We don't have access to R star unless, you know, so, so there are two things you can do. You can compute R star that eventually you will find the best action. Then in hindsight, you can say, you know, you, you live your life, you realize something was good and then you go back and say, if I had done this in the past, you know, what would be the reward I would have gotten? And you can measure the difference from that. Or sometimes you just define the problem and you want to study different algorithms and you know the optimal action, but the algorithm does not know. And this will, we can get our stuff. So if I assume this setup where reward is zero and one, and if I take the dumbest algorithm or the worst algorithm, not the dumbest, but the worst algorithm, my regret is going to be T. And why is that? because I, I might end up choosing the arm which gives me zero reward at every time. The best I can do is to get a reward of, of one at every point, right? So at max at every time step, my regret is one. So after T time steps, my regret is going to be T. Now, if you look at the explore first algorithm, it gives me a regret, which is T to the power two by three into some order log term. So it is better than random. But does but is this an optimal algorithm? And the notion of optimality is well illustrated by this graph. Right? I have algo one, which ends up finding the best arm eventually. But algo two is better, right? Because this is the amount of money which you could have made, but you did not make. You have lost this money. So this again illustrates the difference between supervised learning and what you're doing in online decision making. You don't have a data set to begin with. You're collecting data on the fly, right? I can't wait. I mean, I just can't wait to collect data first because the customer is coming to me. I need to do something, right? So that is what adds to this online part of this problem. So it turns out we can do better than the explored first algorithm. And that is comes from the upper confidence bound algorithm. Right. Now let's, let's look at this UCB algorithm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the algorithm, feel free to you know, post your questions or you know, raise your hand. And once we are done with the algorithm, I will answer all the questions which are coming up on the chat. So what is the intuition behind this? So the intuition is that when we were doing explore first, we had the explore phase and an exploit phase. So the explore phase, my strategy was blind to the fact that as I'm exploring, I might have realized 
that some arm is better than the other ones, but I'm not making use of that information, right? Which is what is I meant by non-adaptive exploration. We explore and exploit separately. Versus adaptive exploration, where I'm exploring and exploiting simultaneously. Right. What, what that means is, as I am getting data, I can update some belief on what harm to choose. And the way to do this is to say, I'm going to choose the action which maximizes the estimate of rewards, which is my exploitation. But I'm going to add one more term, which is telling me how to explore. Now this term, if you see it's square root of t by k. Now what is k? k is the number of times I've pulled the arm i. So if I've pulled the arm i less number of times, this term is going to be high, right? Which means that I might have more uncertainty in my estimate of how good the arm is. But if I have used the arm many, many, many times, then I'm pretty confident that this is the reward that this arm is going to give me, right? So this trading off how sure I am about the reward of this arm and my uncertainty. How does this work? Right. Initially, if I have three arms, you know, my confidence on all the three, my confidence on the reward estimates is pretty large. Oh, sorry, I'm, my confidence is very low which is visualized by large confidence bars over here, right? So if I take an action, I'm going to become more confident on the reward of the second arm, right? Similarly, you know, as time progresses, my confidence, I'm going to become more and more confident. And this confidence is coming from this term, right? Now we will, in a, in a minute, in a couple of slides, we will see how this term comes in. But why, what I want you to take from this term is what is exploitation, what is exploration? We are going to look at how these factors come in a bit. And this approach is called optimism in face of uncertainty. What does that mean? That, you know, I have some uncertainty about my reward, but I am going to be optimistic in the sense that I, I, I believe that this arm could give me a high reward. I have just not tried it enough number of times, right? Versus pessimistic could be saying that, well, I've tried it once, the reward was not super high, so I don't think it works, right? That would be pessimistic. Optimistic is I've tried it only once, you know? And so these, these notions will become much more mathematically concrete in, in two slides, right? So, Let's first see what this algorithm gives us. The regret this algorithm gives us is square root of n, right? It's square root of n t log t. Turns out this is the best we can do up to log factors. So in this particular setup, where the rewards are between you know zero and one, and as someone mentioned in in the chat that this environment, the dynamics are fixed, right? That the rewards are not changing over time. Right? In that setup, we can find an algorithm which can trade off exploration exploitation. And it can, and it is optimal. Now, what do you mean by optimal? It optimal means that the, there cannot be a better strategy than UCB if I don't know anything else about the system. But there could be you know, some cases where I have some more information about the system. Like it could be I a priori know that these three arms are better than the other two arms. Right? Then I can exploit that information and become better than UCB. When we say optimal, we say optimal with respect to the general formulation where we are not assuming anything more about the system. Okay. Now let's look at, you know, where does this term actually come from? 
so i have tried my arm ki number of times so what i have is an empirical estimate of mu r so initially with few samples this estimate is going to be really bad so if i had the ground truth estimate my my life would be very easy i would just choose i would just choose the maximum but i don't have it and i only have mu hat so what the principle of optimism says is let me try to find this mu prime so that it is you know so that the actual reward is a lower bound to my estimate right so i want to be more optimistic than what the actual reward is going to be and i want to construct such a mu prime so if i had the ground truth reward i could just choose the best one i don't have it what i have is new hand the principle of optimism says that because my estimate is bad let me try to construct a new estimate and the property i want is that the new estimate should always be higher than the ground truth reward right of course we cannot guarantee always but we can guarantee it in the probabilistic sense right what we can say is the probability that the actual reward is higher than my estimate is really small okay and turns out that if i assume my rewards are one sub gaussian which is you know form of distribution then the choice of mu i prime or is the following right so this log terms they pretty much come from the concentration bounds of sub gaussian distributions i will link to the proof of this result so there will be some readings again so lecture where we will link to the proof okay what is some one sub gaussian one sub gaussian means so sub gaussians are distributions whose tails decay faster than a gaussian one sub gaussian would be a gaussian with a unit variance right you are decaying your tails faster than a gaussian so turns out if i take this choice then this thing is true right and this is why this algorithm is called upper confidence bound right my estimate mu i prime is always higher in the ground truth estimate and turns out that we can also put an upper bound on the average number of suboptimal actions you know the bound comes out to have us you know a term which is log in t and has this term delta square on the bottom which is the difference between my best arm and the second best arm so it also we all we also can say something about how many bad actions we are going to be taking right okay any questions on this part i see a bunch of questions on the chat i think some i mean if you want to you know i think there is a lot of questions in the chat and comments so instead of scrolling if you want to maybe raise your hand and ask me a question i am happy to answer now or we can so if your question is about proofs which are more detailed we will have references to them that you can look up the other question about delta and t i think you will find it in the proofs you know it depends on how fast uh so it depends on you know if you take a small t the delta is going to be larger right because if i only have a few time points and if i'm averaging across them then my concentration of my random variable by central limit theorem is not going to be that much right so that is what how these delta and t gets related and the exact nature i think simon you will find in in the proofs but that's the intuition 
the which is the central limit theorem how things become concentrated as you take more uh times yes yes okay so now let's you know see what was you know good about this setup is that i can find a near optimal strategy to act in this setup right but there's some but i was right now showing my websites but i was not really accounting for some features of the user right typically i know something more about the user for example there's a male in 30s computer savvy you know female in her 20s computer savvy but the next question comes up is how do we use these features in decision making and this leads us to contextual bandits now some examples are you know like the podcast recommendations that we saw right depending on who the person is we want to suggest different podcasts right so it could be you know the demographics of the user it could be discrete for instance or it could be continuous right for example i can know the person is from switzerland or i might know the latitude and the longitude of the person right and depending on where the person is i might want to give him or her a wine podcast or a beer podcast right so maybe if someone is in france france you know french love wine so maybe i should give them wine right maybe if you're from germany you know you love beer more right so we are more interested in the beer podcast so we will want to use this information to now make decision so now my reward does not depend just on the action it also depends on the state where the state over here is some features of the user so other examples are you know time of the day or the year right for example when 2021 started you know maybe you want to see some podcast about new year resolutions right or it could also be the user mental state right so there are many many things which can help you decide better on what arm to choose so the naive approach one could take is to say well i'm going to run an independent bandit for each context what does this mean suppose the only information i was going to take was the user demographics right which is what country do they come from switzerland or say france or germany right so i could make one bandit for france if a user comes from france i could use one bandit which would help me choose the podcast if the user comes from germany i can use a different bandit right so i can have two bandits one for each context right this is the simplest thing you could be doing right so this is the naive approach of using context now but you know this is problematic because i might not be able to enumerate all possible context if my space becomes large if it is countries maybe it is okay right maybe i have 180 countries you know give or take but sometimes my context can be continuous and that creates a problem i can't use this naive approach so turns out that even in this case there is a better approach and which will also achieves near optimum performance under some assumptions right and the assumption is that if the rewards are linear in the context right so my reward of the action a is a linear combination of my state features right so theta is fixed but i don't know it a priori so is is the setup clear you know before i jump into it is the setup clear so so maybe let me break into two steps you know first let me see is the naive approach 
Does that make sense what the naive approach does? So, so, so one thing I would say is, you know, sometimes when we read naive approaches, you know, in courses, we feel like, okay, this is too naive. But turns out sometimes you go and work for companies or you have your own startup, this is what you end up doing. Because it is simple to implement, right? And you, you get started. And as you get more data, you can do more complex things. So I think it is always important whenever you get a problem to ask yourself this question. What is the most naive thing I can do? And why this naive thing will not work? Right. So William, you had a question. Is one bandit of each means does mean one policy for each context? Yes. It means a different policy for every context. Any more questions about the naive approach? No? Okay, so then, then let me ask, is the assumptions over of the Lin UCB clear? What I'm assuming, right? My states are my features, like male 30s computer savvy, you know? And I'm saying my reward is a linear combination of them. I don't know how the rewards linearly come together, but I know it's a linear combination. So it turns out, you know, I can pretty much apply UCB on this linear estimate, right? And I can choose the strategy which produces me the maximum reward plus some exploration term, which we will see how it comes up, right? And this is also optimal up to log factors with the same intuition. So the reason we are spending you know, so much time on these bandits and contextual bandits is because they illustrate the exploration exploitation problem in its simplest form. In reinforcement learning, the same problem will become really complex. Right. So we are just seeing the cases where we actually have good solutions to the explore exploit problem. So let's let's you know build on the Lin UCB, right? So in Lin UCB, I have my state, I have a reward approximator, which gives me the reward for different possible actions. Now you might be like, what do I, what do you mean by different possible actions, right? So it could be, you know, like the context uh, that is there. So I have a reward for each action, right? And what I want to do is I want to choose the best one, which is this. Right? So I, I get a new state. I have my current theta. I compute the dot product. I get an estimated reward. Then I want to choose. Then I have the reward for all actions, right? Now, so now, so for example, if your, you know, see, suppose your different actions are different podcasts that you want to recommend, right? So you have a theta for each podcast, and then you have some state which is what the user preferences are. So this term is pretty much telling you what is the likelihood or what is the likelihood of the user actually listening to this podcast. So each, just think of, I have to recommend a podcast. Each podcast has a, so instead of choosing the podcast, which we were doing in bandits, now I'm choosing the theta or the parameters corresponding to the podcast, right? And then I'm evaluating the reward I would end up getting. Right? So, that, so that's the key distinction between bandits and how I'm doing contextual bandits. In bandits, I was choosing the podcast directly. Now I'm not choosing the podcast, I'm choosing the parameters theta corresponding to the podcast. And saying, given the user representation S, how likely is the user to get the podcast? So, sorry, the action space over here is also, it could be discrete, it could be continuous. 
I'm sorry, this diagram is a bit, bit misleading. The action should be as an input over here and not as an output. I think that would clarify things. Let's think of there's only one output R hat and the action is as input, S and A. So theta we are going to find out. We are not manually specifying it. We're just writing down our model. Does that answer your question, Ayush and Terry? Yeah, it answers for me. Okay. Okay. So now what we have is So what, what now what we have is we have time steps T. So I can rewrite this as I have some states S from zero to T and I have rewards from time zero to T. Right. And the way I'm going to find theta is by solving this linear regression problem, which says I want to estimate my reward. The ground to reward is R and my estimate is R hat. So Anubhav, the the states are not coming from the regressors. A state is the feature. I'm using the thetas to just find the reward. So I'm just trying to learn theta, which can help me predict the reward of a given state. But what is the state? The state over here corresponds to the features of, you know, of the user, right? Which is the state over here? Like, are you computer savvy? You know, what is the age? Where, which country you are coming from? And you're saying, given these states, I'm going to multiply by theta, which is tell, telling me how likely is this state going to like the theta or, or this particular podcast. And each podcast, each podcast has one theta. Now, the way I can solve for theta, I can do, you know, rich regression to solve for theta. Now, instead of having the raw state, you know, I could also have some features of the state and I could define, I mean, instead of saying, uh, you know, latitude is this, longitude is this, and this is the image, which could also be a context, right? I could take some features of the image. So I can just make it X. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is a rewrite, which is I'm going to call this A, and I'm going to call this B. And then we'll see how do we solve this in an online fashion, which is the fact that, you know, I need to update my parameters theta as I am getting more information about that action, which is then going to influence my estimate for that action. So there's some questions coming up about how do we treat it with continuous actions? Uh, just hold them for now. I think let's follow through the way we are doing it for discrete. I mean, it, 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 it might appear it only works for discrete actions, but we'll see how we can make it continuous. It, it will become clear in some time. Okay. So now we need to solve this in an online fashion. Now I'm going to do, I'm just going to say how we can do online regression, right? That's pretty much what this algorithm is going to look like. I have my time steps T. I'm observing, you know, features of all the arms where all of my arms over here are uh, the different recommendations I want to give and X are the features, right? And as we saw this theta, is these two terms, A times B. And I'm going to compute my reward, which is theta times my features, right? But I'm also going to add an exploration bonus term. This exploration bonus, it is almost a covariance, right? So if you see, this is a covariance matrix. This is also the, co it's a square root of the covariance, right? So this again is the same intuition that we had in UCB. You create an upper confidence bound, assuming some distribution of the rewards, the rewards being Gaussian, from which you get this exploration bonus. So now as you were doing with UCB, I will choose my arm, which maximizes 
my rewards and I'm going to do an online update with the new data point I get to get my A and B, which will give me the new parameters theta. Right. So this is the Lin UCB algorithm. So just to maybe make some things which were not very clear in the way I introduced Lin UCB. So in all of my introduction, what I've assumed is the state space can be continuous, but the action space I've assumed to be discrete. So let's just understand Lin UCB in that context. And then we will see, you know, either today or, you know, in lecture three or four, how it also works for continuous state spaces or continuous action spaces. But before I, you know, go further, you know, any questions on the Lin UCB that you walked through? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in, in when you when you update the AT, uh, the big A and uh, little B, why do you add uh, X, X X transpose? Oh, sorry, I mean, this is just supposed to, you know, you're doing what line 12 and 13, 13 are doing. Yeah. This is saying what it amounts to, right? If you were not doing the online version. So I was trying to motivate this, but this is, you know, I was motivating this, right? So this is what the term A and B are, right? Okay. So if you had the data set, this is what you would do, but you're doing this in an online fashion, right? But the way you do it is, you know, if you get, let me, you know, skip some and you'll see it, right? So what, what you end up doing is you initialize, if you get a new action, right? Or if you get a new podcast, you're initializing this with the matrix I, right? And B is initialized to be all zeros. And now okay. you are doing this update iteratively. So you end up doing this, but in an online fashion. And, and where the, the regula regula regularization term uh, goes, the, the lambda? So that is over here, right? It's chosen to be one over here, right? Okay. It's, it's a initialization. Okay. okay. So Simon, can I explain the online update? So what I mean is the data is coming in, right? So when you get one data point, you want to update your A. So this is what it is doing. It is taking one data point and computing X, X transpose and adding it back into A, right? And this is a term on B, I'm just adding the term. I'm not, did I answer your question, Simon? Or maybe do you have a, like a question about the, the implementation or the intuition? Question about the yeah, implementation, like the the, ma the mathematics behind the online update, like why? I mean, what is the little r, um, the small x, and how does it relate to um, updating for one point? So small r is a reward you get. So you choose the r that you want to choose, right? Say eighty. When you apply eighty, you get a reward rt, right, from the environment. Now you want to use this reward to update your parameters theta. Now this has two terms, right? The A term and the B term. When you write down linear regression, right? So if you, if you write a linear regression, then you say, I want to add one more point. What do you do, right? I mean, we are multiplying your reward by the X and adding it back. This is just writing, it is just writing one step of the matrix multiplication. So that is what is happening over here. I'm solving linear regression when I'm adding one data point by one data point. Linear, linear regression involves solving matrix multiplications. So instead of doing the matrix multiplication, I'm doing the matrix multiplication sequentially. So maybe that you know explains what I mean by online over here. So now a question comes up is, you know, what we have been assuming 
is that this parameter theta a is different for each context right oh sorry so there is a different theta a for each podcast i want to recommend right it is different theta for each action now the good thing is you know this allows us to get a simple algorithm which you know we can prove that things are optimal in the linear setting the con is that i cannot share information between podcasts right for example if i know both the two podcast belong to you know nature or they belong to technology there is no way of sharing information across them so this is you know something which is not ideal about this algorithm the other question you might have is you know what happens if there are new podcasts or new articles which are coming in right because the number of podcasts are always increasing or decreasing so do i need to know a priori how many podcasts or news articles are going to be there turns out no right if i get a new article just initialize a and b in this following form and you can still reuse the same algorithm right so we don't need to assume a, a fixed number of arms the regularization does not changes in this one it is set to 1 in lin you should be the basic formulation it's set to 1 and only if you have some more information about the arm some prior information you can build it in so 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 you should be and lin you should be are two things that you will be doing in homework 1 right so you will get to get your hands dirty you know try out and implement versions of these algorithms and compare them so this is exactly what homework 1 is going to focus on lin you should be and you should be okay any any more questions over here Yeah, I do have another question. Um, could you explain more the the effect of adding a, a regularized term, comparing to initialize a big A to zero? So, so, so think. So this term is the covariance matrix of my features, right? So if I have a reason to believe that some features are more important than the other features, you know, I could use the lambda. sorry so so when i am you know when i am starting off with my process right if i don't know you know anything about how one arm relates to the other arm i'm going to initialize it with the identity matrix right but if i have you know maybe some other information you know for example i know the singular values of some of the features are going to be really small and therefore you know when i am going to take the inverse it's not going to work out right then you know i would want to introduce this lambda to make sure my optimization ends up being stable instead of my optimization you know giving me instabilities over there So, so that is one perspective on how this lambda is going to help you but you know typically when you're doing lin ucb you just choose lambda to be equal to 1 okay so maybe i should have done this except i mean the reason i used lambda in the first place was to you know motivate that what you're trying to do is reduce regression and the same intuitions that you use in this regression to choose lambda you end up using over here right so what lambda ends up doing eventually is feature selection that it can help you choose what features are more important what are no so if you have some information about it you can encode that into lambda but it becomes you know non obvious how to do it so therefore typically you would do cross validation in supervised learning setups 
but in bandits, you know, you really can't do cross validation, right? Because everything is happening in an online fashion. To do cross validation, you need a data set and you need to run things with different hyperparameters. You know, that's something you cannot do in an online setup. You don't have the luxury of cross validation. For the only way to choose Lambda is if somehow magically you have some a priori information about what features are important and you build it in. But if you don't just choose Lambda is equal to one, which is a uniform prior over the features. Does that answer your question, Jules? Uh, yeah, that was exactly my question, in fact, uh, because as we cannot do uh, cross validation, um, I thought that uh, there was a huge input for putting the, the Lambda, even if we can do cross validation. But on the other hand, I, I thought that we could maybe just put a, a zero coefficient uh, before uh, irrelevant feature or not incorporating them. Uh, yes, yeah, so you, you can put zeros also. I think that's fine. That will come down to you know ordinary least squares, right? Yeah. The only problem is it can give you numerical instability. Okay. Thank you. Can I can I ask one more question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the bound is for under the assumption that your reward is linear up the features. So I, I just wonder for practical problems, um, your approximation between your uh, linear model in terms of features and the true reward might be arbitrarily bad and throw this bound off. So I was just wondering, I mean, are there some practical uh, cases where this has performed well or the bound is actually held well? Like is, is linear a good enough approximation for, for a lot of settings? So, so there are two things you can do, right? One thing you can do is you can make the features be non-linear. You can put the non-linearity into the feature, right? But the bound won't hold anymore. <laughs> well, the bound, the bound will hold if you can find those non-linear features, right? So it is saying that it, so the bounds of, so the assumption is that the rewards are linear in some feature space. I see it. So you could try to find the feature space that makes it linear, you're saying. Yes, yes. you can I find see. the feature space, but then, but then to make the bound hold, you need to do that search over feature space, right? Which is going to be hard to do, right? So, but if you could find the feature space, you could do it. If you can't, then you would put in non-linear function approximators. Right? Instead of having a linear layer, you'll have a neural network over here. Right? In that case, all the bounds will go away. Right? So practically, a lot of recommendation systems do use lin UCB today. Right? So this is one of the most popular algorithms which is used in, you know, even for doing A-B testing or, you know, when you have to do recommendations. But this was, you know, initially proposed, you know, out of Microsoft for news article recommendation. Great. So I think, you know, what we have done in today's lecture is to, you know, kickstart our initial investigation into, you know, reinforcement learning. And I think we covered two parts, you know, bandits and contextual bandits. But in contextual bandits, you know, what is the issue? The issue is that actions don't change the future, right? Whatever I do is not changing my state, which is what happens in things like Atari games or not in, but in, in, in the real world, right? I mean, okay, I should not have said Atari games. I, what I meant to say was Atari game is a good example where you have a state. If you take an action, the thing actually changes, right? which is representative of many scenarios in the real world. So this is what we're going to look next, is what happens if actions actually change the states that I am visiting. Right. With that, I'm going to stop for today. And 